Isn't it good to be in God's house? Thank you so much, worship team. Didn't they do an awesome job? We appreciate you guys leading us into the presence of the Lord. Well, you know, it's been a pretty, so far, I mean, it seemed like summer started off late, but uh, the sun is finally here, and it seems like it's out in its full splendor, right? It's hot outside. But as hot as the sun is outside, you know, God is doing something inside. And, uh, you know, this morning, I just wanted to share, um, just for a few moments, I know there's a lot that's going on with summer. It's a busy time for everybody. Online family, first of all, I want to just say a big welcome to you guys. So nice to have all of you joining us from different parts of the world. We appreciate you. We pray for you regularly. And uh, Quinnell Campus, great to have you with us as well. We love you and appreciate you. Pastors Vic and Diana, you guys are so incredible. Just so grateful for the leadership team we have. And aren't we so grateful for Dr. Fazel? Doesn't he do an amazing job just leading us, leading the house? Um, how many of you were here for RBD night on Friday? Wasn't that awesome? Wasn't that great? Don't you appreciate the truth that came forth? I know everyone that came really, really enjoyed it. And it's a tool that God's using to access his people, really to touch people's hearts and people's lives. And you know, this morning, as I was just preparing for what God, I believe God wanted to share with you this morning, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, came up in my spirit um, a little while ago was just talking about our pursuit for him. And really today's message, um, I want to read two scripture verses, but the first scripture verse is found in Psalm 107.9. And we're going to title the message today, The Rewards of Spiritual Hunger. And Psalm 107.9, let's look at that, and I'll read it here. It says, For he, talking about the Lord, satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with what? Come on, goodness. He satisfies the longing soul. Another word for that is thirsty soul. And he fills the hungry soul with goodness. Let's look at Lamentations uh, chapter 3 and verse 25. Lamentations 3.25, it says, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Come on, we need to read that again. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. That word wait, of course, it means waiting with expectation, anticipating God when you're waiting for him. He's not going to keep you hanging. How many of you guys have waited for somebody and they've left you hanging for a bit, right? God doesn't do that. God he satisfies and he shows up when we expectantly wait for him. And this morning, I just, uh, how many of, I just, I'm curious, I know online family, maybe you can respond uh, electronically for us, just on your phones or iPads, but uh, for here that are local, um, how many of you guys are sensing something awakening inside of you to a, degree, a greater degree in your hearts of a desire for more of God? How many of you guys sensing that? Now, if you're not, that's okay too because you're in the right place. You're, you're in a company of people that are hungry for God. And really this morning, um, I want us to, I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit, when you leave this place, you're going to be more hungry for God than you've ever been before. And one of the things, you know, I'm, I was reminded of, it's in John chapter 16, and it says verse uh, 26, it says, in that day you will ask me nothing. You will, sorry, in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you, this is Jesus speaking, that I will speak to you, um, sorry, that I do not say to you that I shall pray to the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. The Father, Jesus is saying, for the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. So the first thing I want to establish this morning is that, number one, God loves you so much. And as I was thinking about this, it's like the Lord was reigniting in my heart his desire and his passion for his people. Now you think about it. Everything that Jesus did and that the Father did through Jesus was so that he can have an intimate space with his people. That he can have intimacy, that he can walk in close quarters 
with his children, with his family. Everything that the Father did was for you so he can have access into your life. Just think about that for a moment. God desires relationship with you far beyond you could ever think or imagine. God yearns for it. And every time we gather together in his house corporately, the Father himself comes with an expectation and anticipation excitedly, desiring and waiting to meet with you. So the Father's here. The Holy Spirit's here. And he wants to touch your heart this morning. And this, today I thought uh, I, was, I was praying about, Lord, what direction do you want us to go in today? And the passage of scripture that I want us to really look at this morning is found in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 7. Now this is a story um, about uh, Joshua and the children of Israel. They, you know, they came out of the land of Egypt. And uh, Bev shared about it, you know, a few weeks ago talking about how they, you know, Moses goes up to have this encounter with God for 40 days and 40 nights. And he comes down from the mountain. And it says that... Uh, while he was away, the children of Israel, you know, they became restless. And they actually, you know, they wanted a God that they could see, that they could handle, that they could touch. And uh, they convinced Aaron somehow, you know, and they made a golden calf out of all the gold that they took, the wealth that they took out of the land of Egypt. And they made this golden calf. They made something with man's print on it. They made something that they could look at, touch, feel, see. That's right there in front of them. And they began to worship that thing. And God was so upset and angry that he had to cut off his time with Moses. And he says, Moses, you need to go back down to the camp because the children of Israel have sinned greatly against me. They've made an idol. So Moses comes down from the mountain and he sees what takes place. He grabs the stones that God wrote on. He throws them on the ground. They break. And uh, he's upset with what he sees because the children of Israel made something with their own hands and they were worshiping an idol before the Lord. And so Moses grabs this thing, he grinds it down to powder, he throws it into the river, he makes the children of Israel drink out of the river and uh, following that, let's pick it up here. Verse seven. It says, Moses took his tent and he pitched it outside the camp Far from the camp. I want everyone to say that with me. Say, far from the camp. Ready? One, two, three. Far from the camp. And called it the tabernacle of meeting. Okay, so Moses does something very interesting here, okay? He creates a space outside of the crowd, of a familiar place where everyone was gathered, hanging out, and he makes it outside, far from the camp. I just love the Bible. So descriptive, right? It wasn't just outside, but it was far. That's a great distance. It's describing a great distance away from the familiarity of all the activities of what was transpiring, you know, in the camp there with the children of Israel. And he says he called it the tabernacle of meeting. In other words, Moses made a place, and I didn't hear anywhere where God instructed him to do this, but Moses made a place. He was intentional about setting up a place for God to come down and encounter not just himself, but wh whosoever would like an encounter. And let's keep reading. And it says, And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So again, the Bible's making it very clear that this place where God was going to meet with his people was outside the camp. And people had to make an effort, a concerted effort, concerted effort to step away from the busyness and the hustle and bustle of everything that was transpiring in the camp and they had to make an effort to go outside the camp far away from the camp so that they can encounter God. So in other words, only those that were hungry for God would make the effort to go outside the camp to meet with God. And I love what the scripture says here because it says, if we can read that again, everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting. Everyone who sought the Lord. doesn't. Not everyone sought the Lord, but everyone who sought the Lord made that journey to go to that tabernacle of meeting that Moses erected for the sole purpose of God himself coming in to meet with his people. 
to encounter them. So there were some hungry people that desired God, and really what it was doing, it was, there was a separation between people that were hungry for God and desiring God, or, and with the people that were just okay with just the status quo of life and just living. Remember, we were created for relationship with our Creator, for the sole purpose of that. So in essence, God was exposing the hearts of people through this test of would, or who's willing to come unto me because I'll, I'm willing to meet, but I'm only willing to meet with those who are willing to make an effort, who are hungry for me, and I'll, I'll encounter those people. And so there was a separation that was taking place because everyone who sought the Lord could go encounter God at the tabernacle of meeting. How many people missed out? How, how and, and, and as I'm reading this, I'm looking at this, I'm, uh, you know, it's like the Holy Spirit was reigniting on the inside of me that we have to be intentional about our relationship with the Lord and about our pursuit after Him. How intentional are we, church family? How hungry are we for the Lord? Because God's hungry for you and relationship with you. He yearns for it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus came to break down the wall that separated us from accessing the holy of holies. The moment he said it is finished, the veil of the temple was torn in two. And from that point on, through Jesus, we can step into that holy place and meet with God at any single moment in time but it's gonna take us being intentional about it. So there's rewards for those that are spiritually hungry. And the greatest reward is an encounter with the Lord himself. Now here, let's continue reading. It says, so it was when Moses went out, verse eight, to the tabernacle that all the people rose. So people could come, whoever wanted to seek the Lord can come out to this meeting place that Moses erected that was far from the camp. And it says every time Moses went out there, the people rose, they got up. And each man stood at the tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle or the meeting place, the set place that he had set to meet God, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. In other words, God showed up every time Moses stepped into the tabernacle of meeting. Remember, this is Old Testament and it's giving us an example because what I see here is I see a hunger in the father to meet with his son, Moses. And remember, this applies to you because there's still a hunger and a yearning in the heart of the Father to meet with his sons, his spiritual sons, his children, his people. Not talking about gender, but the spirit of sonship. And the Lord talked with Moses. I love that. He talked with Moses. Imagine those conversations that would have taken place. And all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle of the door. You know, if, if that was me, I'm just trying to put myself in that position. If I seen Moses, my leader, going into the tabernacle of meeting and encountering God and talking to him face to face, and I know that there were others that went and met with God, we don't have an account of their encounter at the tabernacle of meeting. But the Bible does say everyone who sought the Lord went to that place. And so we don't know what God spoke to them. But if I'm sitting there watching Moses going to this designated place of worship or intimate communication or intimate relationship with the Lord, I would say, hey, I, I, I would like to go there and experience that. They watched him. They watched the, the cloud come down. And they seen him standing, uh, standing at the tabernacle door. And then it says, and all the people rose and they worshiped each man in his tent door. Every time Moses went to this tabernacle of meeting, the cloud came down, the people stood outside, and they began to worship at their place of residence, at their tent door. And it says, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, 
as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. Isn't that awesome? What a cool, incredible ex experience that would have been. Now, just a side note, we're going to come back to this. But in Mark 135, if we can quickly jump to Mark 135, and this is Jesus now, and it says, Now in the morning, having, been, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So remember, Jesus just came off doing all these miracles, seeing the crowds, the multitudes coming around him, people being set free and delivered, healed supernaturally. But it says Jesus did something very interesting here. In Mark 1.35, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he, Jesus, went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. What is prayer? It's communion and fellowship with the Lord. Doesn't that sound familiar with what Moses did? Jesus left everything familiar. He had to leave the crowds. And this was his custom. This was what he, how, he, how he lived his life. And he left, and he went to a quiet place where there wasn't anyone. And he communed with the Father. He had fellowship with the Father. Sounds like what Moses did, right? He made a, erected a tabernacle that was far away from the camp to commune and fellowship with the Lord. What's God saying? I believe the Lord's saying here that we have to be intentional about pursuing him. That there is a reward, that God wants to reward our spiritual hunger. The Bible says, seek and you will find. Ask and it will be given. Knock and the door will be opened. Now let's go back to that story. Exodus cha uh, chapter 33. And uh, what are we in? Verse 9, I think. Or verse 11. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend and he would return to the camp. But a servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Oh, I love that. But his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from from the tabernacle or the meeting place with God. In other words, there was a hunger in Joshua that he encountered the Lord. He was encountering God at that place and he wouldn't leave that place. He could have gone back to the camp and he could have mixed and mingled with everybody else. But there was a cry in him. There was a hunger in him that says, I am not satisfied. That place doesn't fulfill me like me being here in position in the tabernacle of God where God's tabernacling with his people or meeting, encountering his people. Joshua said, I'm hungry for more of God. And I'm not, I'm not willing to compromise. You see, when we're hungry, hungry people become desperate. When there's a hunger in us, there's a desperation or there's a cry. There's an intensity within us that says, I'm not satisfied until I apprehend the thing that I feel can quench my hunger or quench my thirst. I'm not satisfied. So I'm, this morning, how many people are hungry for God where you're here today and you're saying, I'm not satisfied with just doing church the way church has always been done? Come on, online family. Quinnell, I know that's for you too. How many of you are feeling that you're, there's a hunger inside of you that says, I'm not willing to go back to the way church was or used to be, but I'm here for a divine encounter with God Almighty, Yahweh Almighty himself. Come on, God wants to encounter his people. God wants to encounter you. He loves you. He's passionate about you. He wants to talk to you face to face. But will you make time for him? Will you separate yourself from the busyness of whatever this world's throwing at you? Even this thing here. Will you throw it away? Say, God, I don't need that. <laughs> Sorry, Lord, I need it, Lord. <laughs> That's like us, though, right? <laughs> are we willing, you guys? How desperate are we? How desperate are we? You see, God wants to encounter us. I believe there's a move of God coming. I believe it's coming to this place. Actually, I believe it's coming to this place. We didn't move here by accident. 
Pastor Fazl, he didn't, he didn't just come here and, and decide to have a church and a nice place, you know, just for us to have nice meetings. There's a hunger and a desire in him, in his heart, in his life, for a divine God encounter, for the glory of God to come and move in this place. You know what I love, uh, Dr. Fazl? I love what you said uh, to me a couple of weeks ago. It really ministered to my heart. But we were just having some conversation, and I remember just as you're walking away, you just put your hands up, and you're like, Dennis... He says, all I want is I want anything that is in my stewardship, this studio, business, bistro, everything. I just want it to be used for the glory of God. That the glory of God could come and move in this place. That's the leadership we have here. Beverly and Robin just didn't move here because it was a, you know, a good idea or a nice thing to do. No, God led them here. God called them here. You're not here because, you know, you're just filling time. God's called you here. God's assigned you to this house here at Covenant of Life. God wants to display his glory through this place, through his people, through his family more than you realize. God wants to move. Are we ready for him, church family? Are we ready for an encounter with God like we've never experienced before? Online family, you're part of this. We're believing, and every time we pray, we're saying, God, however you move here, we pray that it's going to be amplified or multiplied, magnified, wherever our online family's joining us from. The cameras, the technology, the equipment, the microphones, cables, everything in this building is for the sole purpose of bringing glory and honor to Jesus. And that the glory that happens here, you see, God's doing something here in our midst. And whatever happens here is going to go into the nations. So something needs to happen here. We're not just doing this because it's a good idea. It's a lot of money. It's very, very, extremely expensive to do media to any degree of any sort of decent quality. It's very expensive. We, there's a lot of resources, financial resources that go into getting the gospel out, the message out from this place. In fact, it would be easier not to do that. But we're saying, God, you've called us as a house, as an apostolic house, so that your glory can go forth into the nations from this place. But God needs some hungry people. And I'm saying this morning, how hungry are we for God? Or are we willing to leave what's comfortable and step into a place spiritually and position ourselves for a move of God? What's it going to take? It's going to take some self-sacrifice. It's going to take some sowing. But the, this is the beauty of what's happening here. A lot of sowing has transpired from this house you've sown others have sown we've all sown and those seeds that have been sown have come up as a memorial before the throne of God and God says I'm gonna move and I'm looking for a people and I see my house and I see some hungry people and I'm gonna move I'm gonna move and I want to prepare you are we ready for God to move are we ready Jesus left the crowds to pull himself away to fellowship with the Father. Moses did the same, and Joshua says he did not depart from the tabernacle. He didn't leave. He was hungry. He was hungry. You know, you might struggle. You know, Sunday morning might be a lot for you. Wednesday night, don't even think about asking me to come to a time of corporate prayer, Pastor Dennis. You know, I've got a pretty busy life. Oh, really? You're telling me that anything you give up for the sole purpose of pursuing God is going to be an inconvenience for you? Really? We all have stuff going on. But yet, if there's a hunger within us, We're going to say, Lord, this is the priority. I'm not willing to settle. I'm coming out to the tabernacle of meeting, the gathering. The Bible says don't forsake the gathering or the assembling of yourselves together. Come. Seek God. Pursue God. You know, Beverly shared, I think it was last week, talking about 
tarrying. How in the upper room in the book of Acts, waiting for the promise of the Father, not fully look, knowing what it was going to look like. And there could have been upwards of 500 people there that dwindled down to 120. I just wonder if God was just waiting for those that were really serious about a move of God. Jesus said, the word of God says that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh in the latter days. God's going to move. The question is, are we going to be a part of it? And we're saying, yes, Lord. There's some hunger here. There's a desire for more of God. So in the upper room, the Holy Spirit comes down. He fills them all. They experience the presence of God in an incredible way, in a way they'd never experienced before. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in a new language. As God gave them utterance, the whole room was filled with the presence of God. God again was ready to move amongst his family. And you can go from scripture to scripture to scripture. I'll probably close with this in Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. It says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, of what was called the Italian regiment. He was a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people. He was a devout man. He feared God with all his household. He gave generously to the people. And it says, and he prayed to God. How often? He prayed to God always. Something about what Cornelius did ministered to the heart of God. And God said, Cornelius, your day of visitation's coming. It's here. You see, when you start out in a place, you don't know the timing of how or when and how things are going to look at the end. All, that are, all we could see from this scripture is that Cornelius feared the Lord and there was a desire and a hunger in him to do what was right and to seek God. And we can see that. He honored God with his giving. And he says he prayed always. Constant communication. Constant awareness of God. The presence of God. He probably didn't know what that was or what it was, but he had this awareness. There was a hunger within him. And hunger attracts God unlike anything else. We have to be hungry, and then God, it's like wherever there's hunger, God just, whew, he has to show up. And so Cornelius prayed to God, let's continue, and it says, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before me. Cornelius didn't know when or what was going to happen. All he was doing continually, day after day, was giving and praying, conversing with the Lord. But he didn't realize that there was coming a day where God was going to visit him. And let's pick it up here in verse 44. The story goes, Cornelius has this visitation, and the angel tells him, you need to send for Peter. Peter's going to speak to you. And, and so Cornelius gets his household ready, his family, his friends. So he's got his whole house filled with people that were close to him to hear the word of the Lord that was going to come through the apostle Peter. And it says in verse 44, it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. The Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit fell. What did Cornelius do? He prepared a ground or an atmosphere in the realm of the Spirit for the Holy Spirit to come and fall and touch his family and his friends. In an incredible way, they had an encounter with God. He had an encounter with God. Now, if you look at all previous encounters, you can, you can study the past revivals, you'll see that there was a cry in one person at times or just a handful. 
There was a cry in their heart for a move of God. And God wasn't looking for the majority. He was just looking for the hunger. And they were crying out for God. And there was something in their heart that says, God, I'm not satisfied. Remember, he fills the longing soul. He satisfies the thirsty soul. But if we're not thirsty, we can't expect to get satisfied by him. Right? We have to be thirsty so we can experience the satisfaction that comes from heaven. And so we need, a, uh, we need the Holy Spirit to ignite a hunger within us. And we might think we're hungry. I'm standing up here and I'm like, I think I might be somewhat hungry. But I know there's more. And I know it's only by the Holy Spirit can we experience true hunger. So what are we doing? We're doing what Jesus said in, in uh, I think it's Luke 11, 5. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask. And we're saying, Holy Spirit, we want you. We desire you. Every time we come together and pray, church family, whether we're praying as, as staff here or leadership team here, or we're praying corporately on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning, we're praying, God, we're hungry for you. We're asking for God to come and move amongst us. And I'm a little bit nervous when I ask that. To be, to be honest and fully transparent, it makes me a little bit nervous because I don't fully know what that's going to look like. <laughs> I don't. Neither do you. But all I, all I know is that there's enough of a hunger in us, in me, in the, all of us, and we just want God. We're not here to play church. We want to be the church. We want to be a place for the Holy Spirit to move through, unrestrained, unlimited, to touch people and bring people to him to the Father. The harvest is out there. We need a move of God. This nation needs a move of God. Your nation needs a move of God. We need a move of God. But it's going to take hungry people where there's a cry in your heart saying, Jesus, come. Father, come. And we have to be intentional about setting aside time to seek God. You can go from scripture to scripture, story to story, and you'll find this pattern Daniel was another one. He was hungry for God, and God encountered him. He, he prayed. It was 21 days to seek the Lord. There was a cry in him, a hunger, a desperation on the inside of him. And the Lord responded immediately, but it took 21 days for the answer to show up. God's responding to the cry of our hearts. If you didn't listen to what Beverly shared last week, I really encourage you to go back and listen. There's a waiting. There's a continuance. God wants us to continue. They continued in the early church. They continued daily in prayer of one accord. Continued means pressing past barriers and obstacles, not settling, not allowing circumstances to hold us back. Well, we're here to continue. Now, let me just pray. Father, <clears throat> I shared what I feel you wanted me to share this morning. And Holy Spirit, we are so grateful that we have you as our helper. And Father, I thank you so much for this, our church family, our CLM family. We thank you, Lord God, that only you could ignite a hunger within us. But Lord, your church, your house, is to be a place that your glory manifests, that your glory moves through. It's your house. Where else would you want your glory to go through? It's your house. And so, Lord, help us as a church, as your children, to create a space for you to move as you intended to move from the very beginning in this earth. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us to lay down every idol that's in our hearts. Help us, Lord, grind every idol that we've erected, knowingly or unknowingly, Grind it to powder and throw it out. Help us, Lord God, to break every idol down now in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes to recognize those things that would hold us back from pursuing you. Because the rewards of spiritual hunger <laughs> is your presence. It's your glory. It's your providence in every area. And so, Father, we welcome you today. We welcome you, Holy Spirit to come and speak to our hearts 
and show us. Show us. Now, I want you to take a moment, and you're going to talk to the Lord. I want you to have a conversation with the Lord and say, Father, I desire you. If you do, I desire you. I want more of you in my life. And if there's anything in me that's holding me back, Holy Spirit, open my eyes to see it and give me the courage and the strength to address it. Online family in Quinnell, you do the same. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Everything that would hold us back. This is your time, your moment to have that conversation and have, have that talk with the Lord. So take advantage of it. We thank you now, Lord. We thank you now, Holy Spirit, for helping us. Thank you, Lord. Dr. Fazel. <clears throat> Come on, can you sense the Holy Spirit fanning the flame of our hunger in our hearts, the spiritual hunger? As Pastor Dennis was ministering, he's really encouraging us to prioritize time, energy, and make time to be with God, be intentional. God is real. He's not some tradition. He's not a formula. He's real. He loves you. He wants to encounter you much more than you want to encounter him. You know, as I was hearing you speak, Pastor Dennis, I kept hearing Luke 24, verse 15. It's like God is trying to say something to us as a church as he's inviting us into a deeper place in his presence. And there was disciples that were having this conversation. Maybe you've had a lot of conversations going on in your life, and you're talking about what's happening in this season in the world. Maybe you're in the United States. You're talking about the political landscape that you're in right now. Maybe in your country there's another situation that you're in the, you find yourself in. Maybe in your family, in your city, whatever might be going on, you're having conversations. And it's almost like God wants to interrupt those conversations for a moment. And these two disciples were in such a place, two of Jesus' disciples are having conversations. They're on their road to Emmaus, and they're on their way going for a walk a few miles from Jerusalem. And in this walk, they're having this talk about, you know, Jesus was this amazing prophet and mighty indeed, and then he died on the cross, and, and uh, we don't know what's going on. All this commotion in the city, it's kind of quiet. It's been three days since. And now we're hearing these stories that these ladies went to the tomb, and the tomb is empty. Some of them saw visions, and they're saying his body's not there, that he's risen. We don't know what's really happening. So they're thinking and having these conversations, and verse 15 uh, takes place. So, so it was... While they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So here's Jesus. He shows up and starts to walk with them. Listen, this is what God's trying to do. He's trying to say, listen, I'm listening to your conversations. I know what you're thinking about. I know what's going on in your life. But I'm choosing to kind of draw near and join you right where you are and to start to walk with you. So literally Jesus begins to walk with them. And he says, hey guys, what are you talking about? Think about it. This, is, this really happened. What are you talking about? Oh, we're talking about this guy, Jesus. Come on, where have you been? They said to him, basically, where have you been all this time? It's like, have you, had, have you been in the ground or something? And he literally had been buried, you know? It's like, you don't know what's going on. You don't know anything. I mean, they told him the whole thing. There's Jesus, this prophet, and he did miracles. They did this, and now we're hearing all this stuff. And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Jesus says, hey, listen, let me open up the scriptures to you. He goes, you fools. You dummies. Don't you know the scriptures? And he begins to expound the word of God to them. 
And he begins to talk to them about God's word and what it really means. Isn't that amazing? I feel we're in such a time. And that's why Beverly last week when she said something very powerful, she said, do you just want God to give you everything and answer all your prayers? Or do you also want his presence? Like, do you want it without the presence of God? Or do you want that with the presence of God? And I'm telling you, I'd rather have the presence of God. How about you? That's what Pastor Dennis is trying to get over to us. He, that we need the presence of God, folks. Once you taste the presence of God, it is challenging. And I'll tell you what the challenge is. Once you really taste the presence of God, it's very difficult to live life with anything less than His presence. That's why I said, taste and see that I am good. Once you taste His presence, I'm telling you some, you're going to have a hard time living a normal, uh, mediocre life. You're going to be like, I want your presence, Lord. And you're going to prioritize and make time for Him. You're going to declutter your life. You're going to be like, God, I don't have time for this anymore. What's on my calendar that's not important? What shows do I find no, no, no more interest in? Come on, are you with me? You're going to prioritize what you really want. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is asking us to prioritize being with Jesus because Jesus himself is drawing near to us. And that's the sound I'm hearing as Bev is speaking, as Pastor Dennis is speaking, as we've been praying as a team, as a family, for you as the house. We're sensing that Jesus is saying, you've heard me prophesy over this place. You guys have believed for some things. You've sown. There's times you've gotten weary. Sometimes you've had some conversations. You're wondering what's going on. Is it going to happen? Is it really going to happen the way I said? Where are we in that journey? Where are we in that place? And God is saying, listen, Jesus is drawing near. He is literally drawing near to us. That's why we're hearing the invitation, the cry, the summon that God is saying, hey, listen, it's time. It's time. I'm drawing near. While you're in the middle of figuring out your chaos and trying to process everything in your life or the world that you live in, God is saying, hey, listen, I'm drawing near to you. And I'm telling you, we would be, it would be appropriate for us to respond. So these guys start to respond. So they're having conversations around the Word of God. I mean, think about it. The living Word is walking with them and talking about the Word. I mean, he could have come in right off the bat. And here's the funny thing. When they saw him, Brady, they said, they said the Bible says their eyes were beholden. They were, they were scaled, in other words. They couldn't recognize Jesus. Sometimes Jesus can be so near to you and we in our soulish tendencies and our carnality and our busyness and our chaos, we don't even recognize he's right there. He was right with them. They had no idea. They thought they're talking to some stranger visiting from far, far away. They had no idea it's Jesus until he opens up the scriptures and they're like, wow, man, this doesn't really make sense. So while this is happening, they're getting drawn. And what happened was Jesus drew near to trigger hunger. He turned their questions, their concerns, what they were worried about, and he spun them in a way and said, let me turn this into spiritual hunger. The first thing that happens when Jesus draws near to us, we get spiritually hungry. And so... Jesus turns around and says, hey, listen, the scripture says this, the Bible says this, the word of God says this, this prophet said this, this prophet said this. And they're like, oh. And they got so hungry. Here's how we know they're hungry. Because as they came by, one of the people's homes showed up. So then Jesus says, he started to go on. He was going to keep going. Do you remember? And then guess what happens? They say, oh, why, why don't you stay with us? It's getting late. You know, you have a meal with us. And Jesus said, oh, no, I must be going. Come on, think about that. Jesus was going to leave them. Because he was testing to see how hungry you really are. They said, no, no, please, late. You know what happened? They were hungry. As he was sharing the word, they're like, we like being around this guy. He's feeding our spirit. We're no longer confused. We're getting some clarity. As we're getting in the word, the word is burning within our hearts. And then Jesus sits down and has a meal with them. Think about that. You could be having a meal with Jesus and not know he's with you. That's pretty serious, folks. Come on. These are his disciples who walk with him for three and a half years, saw him raise the dead, do miracles, signs and wonders, healings, experience the presence. They themselves experienced his power, worked through them, and yet they couldn't recognize him. Think about that for a moment. 
I pray God opens our eyes today that we begin to recognize and our ears open up, our hearts open up as Pastor Dennis was preaching there. When he started talking about the hunger, about God orchestrating and planning things, putting things into motion in our times gone by, it's not by accident, it's not by coincidence. We are all here at this time. We and all of us around the world because Jesus is drawing near to us. Now, then to go down to verse 30. This is what happens, verse 30. Now it came to pass, and so now they've gotten the house, as Jesus sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. So he's talking about the word of God, and now he's having a meal, speaking, come on, sitting at the table of the Lord, the bread, the wine, communion, they're having fellowship with Jesus. And he breaks bread. Remember, the living bread now breaks bread <laughs> with them. Think about it. And he breaks bread. And the moment he gives it to them, watch what happens. Then their eyes are open. Man, when you, Jesus starts to draw near to you and he starts to feed you, your eyes begin to open. We need to let him feed us. Then, his eye, then our eye, their eyes are open and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Boom, beam me up, Scotty. He was gone. <laughs> Think about it. So now they realize, oh my. I mean, these are the guys talking about, we heard that he wasn't at the tomb. His body's not there. We don't know what's going on. And now they've literally witnessed the resurrected Christ who was having a meal with them. And watch the next verse. And they said one to another, now this is the key. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Listen, when Jesus began, when the scriptures, when the word of God becomes fresh to you, when it begins to burn in your heart, Jesus is near. That's the key right there. See, when you hang out with Jesus, he begins to open up the word to you in a way that you're like, wait a minute, something is happening. And I'm telling you, as God is fanning the flame of his presence and hunger in our hearts, I encourage you to make time with him. Make time to spend time with him. As Pastor Dennis was encouraging us today, let's do it. I know it's summer, many people are on vacation and traveling, and that's wonderful. Get rest with your families, recharge, that's awesome. But even while you're out there resting and relaxing, get up in the morning and spend some time with Jesus. Spend some time in his presence. Become conscious of his presence throughout the day. Every time you notice his presence, acknowledge his presence. Talk to him and say, I, I thank you for being with me right now. I know your presence is here. Anything that you see in your heart responding to him. Pay attention. Cultivate those moments when you begin to say, you know, I kind of sense I should pray. Cultivate it. Start praying. When you have that sense, I just have this hunger. I wonder what that scripture means. I wonder when Pastor Dennis said that, what that really meant. God, I really felt something this morning in church. What were you trying to do with me right now? It's that simple, folks. Father, you touched me with your presence that day. What are you doing in my life today? And you just cultivate it. Just like he, they did. As Jesus talked with them, they practically said, hey, they kept wanting to spend time with him. They didn't know it was Jesus. See, it's interesting how Jesus tests us. So what Pastor Jonah said was, you know, God wanted to test them. So Moses went over here. He said, who's going to come out? Who's going to put some effort in? I don't know why God does that, but he wants to, his love is real, and he wants to make sure yours is too, right? Do you really want him? And that means you've got to lay down some religion if you have some religion. You've got to lay down some pride if you've got some pride. If you're super spiritual and you know everything, well, maybe perhaps you should submit to Jesus and recognize that there's things you don't know yet. <laughs> Not a bad idea. You know what I mean? Maybe you got to be like, hey, you know what, God? I, I've been trying to do everything right and perfect. And, you know, I don't know what's going on, God. I'm so perfect. And, you know, you're not doing what you're supposed to do, God. Maybe you should just make an attitude adjustment. If, if that hasn't worked for you, just humbly saying, if that hasn't worked for you, maybe, maybe you just humble yourself. Say, God, I don't know nothing, but I want you. I want your presence. I long for your presence. I want to really know you. 
I don't care about this anymore. I surrender God. It doesn't matter if it happens for me or not. Yeah, I've asked you for this. I've desired this. I just want you. I want your presence above anything else. And if there's anything in that way, God, I want to prioritize your presence. Prioritize the presence of God. That's what your hunger will do. God gives you hunger. Hunger is supernatural. Blessed is the man or woman whom God causes to be drawn to himself. It's, it's a gift from God to be hungry. And it will never hurt you or, or, or um, be a waste of your time in life to get hungry for God. Hunger is a response to Jesus drawing near to you. And many times Jesus draws near to us, you know, and we just don't pay attention. We don't even know he's there. He nudges us. He kind of, you know, moves us into a certain direction, invites us to come be part of something, and we're like, oh, we're tired. And it's true, we are tired at times. It's practical. But you just don't know when, which moment with God is going to move you forward and break you through. You know, these fighter jets, when they began to learn how to fly and break the sound barrier, now they can go Mach 3, Mach 4, which is Mach 1 is the speed of sound, and then they can just go as fast as you want them. They're going faster and faster. But before, they could only barely make it to the sound barrier, which is Mach 1. So they would make these planes, fighter jets. And when the plane would reach the point of breaking the sound barrier, there's this particular moment, the plane shakes so much. It was so scary. It felt like the plane was going to rip apart. There was so much resistance and pressure. But the moment it broke the sound barrier, boom, you hear that sound, and the plane just takes off, and it breaks through. And sometimes it's like that. When Jesus begins to draw near to you, everything in your life is kind of shaking a little bit. And you're like, what's happening? I'm confused. I'm having this conversation. I'm wondering about this. I'm wondering about this. I'm talking. And Jesus is like, hey, ah, just pay attention to me. Come, let me spend some time with you. And when you do that, boom, you break through like they did. They were wondering, is Jesus even risen? We don't know what's happened. We weren't at the tomb. Some people said they were. They had visions. We don't know what's really going on. And boom, Jesus shows up, answers all their questions in person. And then leaves. <laughs> Just leaves. What was he saying to them? I let you taste and see that I'm alive, I'm real, I'm good, and the word is true. Guess what? Now come seek me on the other side of this equation. You see what I'm saying? And now Jesus is drawing near to us as a church family, as the people around the world. And I want to encourage us today. We want to encourage you today. Let's not miss out. Let's not, and maybe you don't see it yet, and that's okay. Maybe you do see it. That's wonderful. Let's encourage one another to pursue him together. So when we gather, we assemble and get ready. Because I'm telling you, God's not forgotten about us. God's not forgotten about you. In fact, I love what Pastor Dennis said, that he specifically timed your being here. And some of you and some of us have been through a lot of that shaking like that fighter jet, but you're going to be breaking through that sound barrier now in your life. That's what's about to happen to you. And get ready. Don't jump out of the plane now. <laughs> Not a good time. Because that's exactly what happens. And you can visually see it in the sky. When that sound it moves against air and space, it creates this whole thing, whatever you call it. And you can see the plane. You can see photos of a plane going through the sound barrier. And as it breaks it, it breaks through the air, the resistance, the pressure, and free. That's, that's the picture. I wish we had a photo to show you. That's what's about to happen here in this house. That's what's about to happen in your life. That's what's about to happen here, here. This is what God is doing. So get ready. I'm telling you, get ready. One more thing. To the hungry soul, even the bitter things are made sweet, the scripture says. Man, when you get hungry, one of the benefits, Pastor Dennis, is guess what? Nothing bothers you anymore. You're just too hungry. You just can't get offended. You know, you don't have a hunger. You don't have a bitterness problem. You don't have an offense problem. You have a hunger problem. 
You know, if you get a little bitter about something, you just look in the mirror and say, hey, listen, we're going to deal with this bitterness. I'm just going to get more hungry for Jesus. I'm going to take this experience and say, I want more of your presence, Lord. I want more of you. I want to humble myself. I want you. I don't care if that perfect person offended me, betrayed me, did this about me. I don't care. I just want you. I don't have time for any of that. How about that? Right? Remember, Bev talked about offense not too long ago. She goes, that's the thing that keeps you from the presence. But when you're hungry, you can't get offended. You're just too hungry. I mean, listen, if you're hungry and starving in the, naturally and you want to have a nice meal and somebody puts a beautiful steak, if you like steak or your best food or protein or whatever you like to eat, and right before you, it smells great, it's delicious, it's your favorite meal, and you're hungry and someone else has a problem with you, do you care? You're going to eat your food. Are you not? You're going to eat your, I mean, how, how, I mean, how offended can you get with your, mm, mm, so good, this is so good. And, and you're like, someone's like, Yo, what? Hold on a minute, let me just, oh, it's so good. Imagine that. When you're hungry for the presence of God, you're hungry for the presence and person of Jesus. Listen, it starts with one. Like the man said, give me Scotland or let me die. God shows up. Well, what in the world was that? They, there was moves of God that have happened in our history. People don't know about it. No matter what church you've ever been to, it began with a move of God. The Methodists had a move of God. That's why they were called the Methodists. Then they got so methodical, they lost the presence of God. The Baptists had a move of God, by the way. The Pentecostals had a move of God. Azusa Street. Everything began with the move of God. Then man tries to traditionalize it, box it, ship it, package it. And they forget how it all began. There'd be moments where God would respond to people's hungers, where they'd have revival meetings. And people were on, in carriages on horses, and the Holy Spirit's power and presence will come on the horses, and the horses will go straight to the revival meetings. This is history, recorded history. Entire cities would be affected. People would be sitting in bars. And the presence and the glory of God would come into the bars. They weren't having a worship service. They're all drinking. And they said the weightiness of God's presence was so thick in the bars, they couldn't lift the, the beer mug off the counter. And they were made sober instantly. I mean, there was no preaching. There was no four laws, as whatever they're called. I don't, I've never used them in my life. I love the Holy Spirit. And so they're in the bars getting touched by God. Trains would pass by revival meetings. And people are in the train having conversations. But they pass by the vicinity. This is in Chicago. They pass by the vicinity while revival meetings were going on. And the presence of God entered the train. It just passed the area. People began to weep and repent for their sins on the train. Crying out to God. One instant in the presence of God. That's what Pastor Dennis is trying to say to us. To be honest with you, we'd rather have that. We'd rather have that here at this house. We want the presence of God. We're not, we can't make it happen. We also know that. We're very well aware we can't make it happen. But we are aware that God wants to make it happen. So we're saying yes. And we're encouraging you to say yes too. You know, Acts 10.44 is what he ended with. Do you know that's the verse God gave me years ago when he showed me a vision of media and how media was going on these little devices when there was no such thing and he showed it to me going around the world people in their tents were watching it people in their little kitchens they were watching it people were watching it everywhere in the desert they didn't have no smartphones they only had dumb phones back then and they didn't have any iPads but that's what I saw it was in August it was the month of August many years ago <laughs> I know the date, I know the year. It was a Saturday. I was getting ready to speak on a Sunday morning. And I had this vision when I was praying. And God spoke to me, will you go to these, my people? And then he gave this verse to me. Acts 10, 44. 
I said, because I was trying to understand how this is going to happen. And God said, remember when Peter was still speaking and the Holy Spirit fell on them? He said, son, this scripture is for you while Peter is still speaking. These words, the Holy Spirit fell upon them who heard the word. He goes, the day is coming while the word is being communicated and spoken forth. My spirit is going to fall on people. And you're going to see this happen through media where entire nations are going to be born again. And I know some of you, you don't believe that, but can we get a few of them born again then? Are you okay with that? <laughs> you know, can, can we get a, you know what I'm saying? Wherever your faith is, join with me. We'll take the few you believe in. We'll take the hundred you believe in. We'll take the thousand you believe can get born again. And the 10,000, those of you around the world. And together we can see tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of people touched by the power of God. See, that's what media can do. Media can touch them with the presence of God. God showed me one day people will be turning on the television, arguing in their homes, and they're going to turn on media. And the power and the presence of God is going to come into the room, and their son's leg will grow out. And that will get their attention. He goes, I will invade their home. I will interrupt their conversations, and I will touch them with my power. But it starts with a hungry heart, a thirsty soul. It starts with somebody saying, hey God, I, I, I can tell you're drawing near. I don't know where you are. I'm preparing a place for you. It starts by faith, knowing that you are here. It starts by laying down our agendas, laying down our complaints, laying down our offenses, laying down our grievances, laying down our difficulties, our challenges, our, our troubles, our woes, our worries, our whatevers. And whatever doesn't make sense, we say, Jesus, it don't make sense, but it just don't matter. What matters is you. What matters is your presence. And there's been no one that has been denied the presence of God if you seek him. You don't have to wait on another man. You don't have to wait on me. You don't have to wait on pastor. You don't have to beb. You don't have to wait on your neighbor. You can see God right now. You don't need our permission. We don't want to stand in your way. We want to be part of the way and say, let's all do it. We want to join you and say, let's seek him together. Let's draw near to him together. That makes things more powerful. And by the way, God always responds to hunger. In fact, he says he cannot reject the brokenhearted. He cannot reject those that have been rejected. He does not say no to a cry. In fact, if you have a cry in your heart, that cry originated in the heart of the Father. And by the Spirit, it made it to your spirit. And now you're crying out. We're all groaning and yearning, Romans 8 says. We're all yearning for the glory of God. There's a cry already in your spirit for more of Him. So we got to yield to it. The secret to life is to yield to the cry. Follow the cry. The cry will never mislead you. It will bring you in the house. It'll cause you to open up the pages of that book. It'll cause you to pray when it's late at night. It'll cause you to pray to get up early in the morning. You'll get up early. Sometimes you won't be able to sleep. <laughs> then just pray. But listen, when God begins to get on you, you'll become contagious. His hunger is contagious and his presence is contagious. And what you'll find is when you start getting hungry, you may not notice it right away. But shortly after, people start noticing it about you. They're like, what's different about you? Here's another key. When you get hungry, you'll start talking less. It's true. I know this sounds weird to you, but you just find like you have less to say. You'll be like, because you're just kind of aware of God more. You're like, I just need to speak when it's valuable. Come on now. The Bible says, he that talks a lot is never without sin. No, yeah, that's the Bible. She's like, she's like, ooh, ooh, yeah, that's the Bible. Yes, it's Proverbs. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Something happens to you because you become more aware. You're a little bit more careful with what you say. God starts to become bigger. Your problem starts to get smaller. The accusations made against you, they begin to dissipate. It's like water off a duck's back. And you're like, God, it's all about you in the end. The mistakes you made in your life, they begin to fade away through the cross. 
And you're no longer condemning yourself, beating yourself up. All you're aware of is God's goodness, His mercy, His grace, that it's all about Him. It's not about you. Your songs begin to change in your heart. It's all about you, Jesus. You go from it's all about me, Lord, to all about you. <laughs> so I want to encourage you today. Pastor Dennis, thank you for sharing your heart today with us. Thank you for stirring us today to get hungry again and responding to God. So you see here in his example, Moses initiated this, but God responded. And the moment God responds, you just keep getting more hungry. It's awesome. But sometimes you have to initiate, and sometimes you're just responding, all right? Can we receive that this morning? <clears throat> Let's have a, a moment again of prayer, and then we're going to close. Father, we just want to thank you for your presence today. Thank you for your messages coming forth in this season to us. Thank you that you're stirring the hunger and fanning the flame in our hearts. God, we cannot do this without your presence, and we want your presence. We don't want life without your presence. We want the blessing. We want the promises, but not without the presence of God. We want them in the presence of God. We want to become aware of you. We want everything you're doing to make you more known to us in this season. And we're grateful for your mercy. We're grateful for your grace. We're grateful for your presence. And we're grateful for this breakthrough, this sound barrier that I keep seeing the picture of, Lord. We're breaking through. And that Jesus is drawing near to us. And you're calling us closer. And you're opening our eyes. Opening our hearts. That our, heart, that our hearts would burn with fire as you share with us the word of God in this season. And we thank you, Father. We're moving into this place of the movement of your spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Listen, we love you so much. Thank you for letting us just be vulnerable, bold, and transparent with you. We're like you and seeking him with you. Or we don't, we're not saying we're ahead of you. We're right beside you. We might be running a couple steps ahead to run before the, 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 the gate opening up, the rivers parting, whatever the deal is. We're running with you. We're seeking him too. So let our hunger become contagious one to another. Why don't you catch the hunger and spread it? Why don't we get contagious and spread the hunger and the presence of God will just follow. His presence follows people that are hungry and thirsty for him. Jesus said if you, John 7, 37, if you're thirsty, he cried out with a loud, if you're thirsty, come unto me, and I will give you to drink, and I will cause rivers to flow out of your innermost being. John 7, 38. Come on, think about it. Rivers of living water, speaking of the Holy Spirit. If you're hungry, that's what's going to happen to you. He who believes in me, the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers. You'll become a river station everywhere you go for those that are hungry. All right. I love you so much. I was stirred today again by the messages that Bev and Pastor Dennis have been speaking. Really, really being touched. I encourage you. We are praying for you. And I know there's people here we've been praying for on a, quite a bit, actually, specifically, because God put you on our heart. We're praying. We're believing God for everything in your life and in your families. It's like a vengeance from God that says, I, against the devil. That God's like... You know, the scripture, Psalm 68, 1, that's one of the scriptures we've been praying. Let God arise and let your enemies, let his enemies be scattered. It's like God is arising and saying, how dare you? How dare you touch my children? How dare you go after their families? How dare you go after them? Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. I'm telling you, you get hungry and you seek him and you forget about everything else. God arises big on the inside of you. He arises big on top of you, all around you, and his enemies leave. And that's what you want, guys, in this season. You want his enemies fleeing in terror from your neighborhood, from your home, from your street, from your children, from your parents, from your grandparents, if that's the other way around, whatever the deal is. Listen, we want God. We want Him to touch our families. And I'm telling you, as time is short, and I know things are happening on the political landscape around the world, in the United States of America, and I'm telling you, church, time to get hungry in the United States. Big things are going to go down. We're praying for America. 
We're praying for our neighbor to the south. We love our neighbor because God sold us many years ago. He says, I want you to love your neighbor. And he was being specific. He says, I want you to love your neighbor, the United States of America. A lot of things have gone on there in a while. Some things are about to happen. So we're praying for you in the United States of America right now. We're praying for our family around the nations of the world. Bev's in Australia right now, by the way. Ministering to our peop- a whole group of new people down there in Australia. Isn't that cool? Because we have leaders in Australia that are part of the Plumline Network. And they've gathered together some people. They're doing a whole thing on prayer. Advancing in prayer. Isn't, isn't that a good way to advance? Because there's hunger everywhere. They're hungry in Australia. They're hungry in New Zealand. They're hungry in South Africa. They're hungry everywhere. And so, Father, we ask once again, as we're trying to close, that your presence will follow us everywhere we go. <laughs> Throughout the day, throughout the week, and man, come on out on a Wednesday night and join for prayer. You bring the hunger. You bring the presence. You bring the desire to know God. You show up and say, hey, God, we're going to join together and pray. Sometimes it's easier to do it with a group, you see. And let's seek Him together. Forget about everything else, folks. Just prioritize Him. Just, just give it a try and you'll be surprised. I can't tell you if it will happen tomorrow morning or the next day or next week or next month, but I will tell you this. Just seek Him and your life will change. Suddenly you'll begin to see better. You know, that thing I thought that was so important, Lord, I realized that's just a waste of time. Just cut some of that stuff out. I'm not saying go cold turkey. Just kind of limit it a little bit. Get in the practice of putting it away from, from you. And you'll be surprised. Amen. That goes for all of us, right? Because technology can, can get in the way of what God's doing. It can be used for God, but it can also get in the way. So anyway, love you so, so much. And uh, I'm supposed to give the closing announcements. I hope you like my closing announcements. <laughs> well, I got touched by what Pastor Dennis preached today by the Holy Spirit. I thank you. We are hungry folks. We're seeking Him. And we are specifically praying for you every day. And we're having weekly gatherings here as a team. We're praying for you. We're, we're, we're just going after it. And we're asking you to join with us. Let's pray together because the sound barrier is going to be broken and you're going to feel it. We're going to sense it and we're going to go whoo, right through it. And you're going to be like, wow, that's different. And literally that same plane that feels the resistance, the system reverses and all the wind and the space and the pressure propels you through the sound barrier. It completely makes you go forward and you don't shake anymore and it's smooth. That's what you're about to experience. In, in this place and in this house and in your life and around us all across the nation. Amen. Anyway, love you guys. Um, this is the best announcements I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> it's going to be corporate prayer and Bible study here this Wednesday. Junior youth will be here at the Langley campus this Wednesday. Altar prayer ministry team folks, you can come up over here and get prayer if you want. And those of you, there's a link right now online. If you want prayer and you're online, we'll have a team standing by. And if you are a first-time guest, we have a gift for you right in the back in the guest lounge. Wave, wave at me. Who's back there? Someone's back there. Wave at me. There you go. Just go and see them in the back, and they just want to welcome you, love on you, and give you a gift. Anyway, so glad you're here. We're praying for you. We'd love to hear what God's doing. Please keep in touch with us. We can't wait to see you next time. Love you, and God bless you. Thank you for listening. We pray that this message goes deep into your spirit and bears much fruit. If you'd like to learn more about CLM or sew into the work that we're doing, you can do so by clicking the link below. 